Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar hosted by Tordex entitled Development of Real-Time Systems with Embedded Linux. My name is Brandon Shibley. I'm a Solutions Architect at Tordex. I thank you all for coming and I'd also like to thank our technology partner NXP for sharing this webinar. The test performed with the, uh, for this webinar utilized Tordex NXP-based system on modules. For those of you unfamiliar with Tordex, we specialize in embedded computing solutions, particularly ARM-based system on modules or SOMs. We have two families of SOMs within which the modules are pen compatible and interchangeable. We perform hardware and software development in-house. We generally guarantee 10-year product lifecycle support. We offer free technical support directly from our developers. And sales are also handled directly by Toradex, and our products can be ordered right from our website. And finally, we have offices throughout the world allowing us to serve the needs of regional markets with local warehouses and local sales and technical support. This is the outline for today's webinar. I should point out uh, we will not be going into great detail about real-time theory and system optimization. Uh, it's a huge topic with many important subtopics, and I will discuss some real-time concepts, but this webinar is primarily providing an introductory, high-level look at a subset of solutions available for achieving real-time requirements using Linux on ARM applications processors. I'll start by introducing some real-time concepts, and then I'll provide an overview of possible Linux-oriented solutions. We'll then individually highlight three particular solutions which all offer real-time capabilities in different ways, namely real-time Linux, Xenomai, and heterogeneous multi-core. Finally, after providing a conclusion, we'll transition to a question and answer session. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to submit them in the question text box provided by GoToWebinar. And uh, at the conclusion of this webinar, we will be providing a recording of the webinar available at toradex.com webinars or on YouTube, and that'll take a couple days to uh, get uploaded. To begin our discussion about real-time systems, let's talk about what real-time means. I think every talk about real-time has to basically define the term because depending on the context or the use case, the term often carries some additional ramifications. So I'll begin by simply stating that real-time in the context of this webinar refers to the need of a system to reliably meet specific time deadlines. And so by leaving it at that, we're free to discuss a wide range of requirements and solutions. So that said, I think it's important to discuss the nature of the requirements that drive our need for real-time performance. At a top system level, we systems engineers often categorize requirements as being either threshold or objective requirements. Threshold being absolutely necessary and objective being more nice to have, which would contribute to the overall effectiveness of the system. Real-time requirements are often categorized into hard or soft requirements. The concept is analogous to threshold and objective requirements. Hard real-time requirements are those which, when not met, result in system failure, essentially failing to meet a system-level threshold requirement. Whereas soft real-time requirements are those which, when not met, degrade system effectiveness but not necessarily to the point of failure. And as such, there may be a lot more fuzziness involved, and in reality, there can be a whole spectrum of firmness associated with uh, real-time requirements. But it all depends on how much allowance and leeway is provided by the system's requirements. In some cases, we may be able to derive how much or how often lateness can be tolerated before the system fails to meet a threshold requirement. So this topic of requirements is important because it allows us to determine what solutions are viable for the needs of our system. Some examples of general types of real-time requirements are given here. A periodic requirement is one in which the deadline occurs with a fixed period or frequency. These are often buffer related. For example, in the case of data acquisition, most analog to digital converters have a fixed size buffer or FIFO and a fixed sampling rate. When continuously collecting data, the data in the FIFO must be periodically emptied, otherwise it would overflow and data would be lost. Some requirements are event-driven. They are often spontaneous. They may be interrupt-driven or we can otherwise pull for these events 
typically an event-driven requirement that takes dictates that some uh, action or response is performed by some deadline once an event occurs. I also mentioned control examples here. Real-time requirements are very common in control systems for which time plays a very important role. In both measurement timeliness and control timeliness, they are often periodic while also can take into effect system or environmental feedback. And a good example of this is our talk robot, which I will show later. It uses a PID control loop and reads several sensors to balance on two wheels, similar to a Segway. So now that we've discussed some common real-time requirements, we can begin to talk about solutions. I feel confident in saying that nearly all that we've talked about so far can be solved with either hardware or simple microcontroller type systems without the need for operating systems and great deals of complexity. However, nearly all systems have mobile requirements, both real-time and non-real-time. And uh, the picture on this slide is perhaps not the most applicable real-time example, but it does illustrate, as time marches on, the trend towards more requirements, more features, more complexity. One thing that simple hardware and microcontrollers do not accommodate well is large-scale, high-speed multitasking. And this is where application processors and operating systems such as Linux become a must. Unfortunately for our real-time requirements, uh, most highly featured operating systems trade off determinism for speed and abstraction. Uh, but fortunately, uh, there are solutions available which can provide real-time or perhaps near real-time response while allowing us to make use of the highly popular Linux operating system. These are some terms and concepts, most of which are probably obvious or well known to you, but I would quickly mention them to uh, frame further discussion. Latency, this is a system's response time from the moment of a stimulus. Jitter, it's the variability of timing or latency. An event trigger, or a, an interrupt is an event trigger, which can interrupt the system. Context switch is the switching of processor control from one thread of process to another. And preemption is the act of context switching a thread of process off the processor to allow a higher priority task to make use of the processor. So determinism is critical to real-time systems. It basically ensures repeatability. We must be able to ensure that hard deadlines can be met every time. In the case of some soft real-time requirements, maybe not every time. But in general, we must be able to ensure that our requirements can be met and therefore, some level of determinism is key. Some attributes of a reasonably deterministic operating system are a predictable scheduler, bounded interrupts or uh, latencies, and uh, minimal jitter. It's important to note that the Linux kernel itself is simply not completely deterministic. And if we hope to fully utilize all the features of a modern, advanced applications processor, with sophisticated caching, branch prediction, virtualization features, etc., we simply aren't going to achieve a high degree of determinism, although we'll likely pick up some advances in speed. But you must know, real time does not mean real fast. Such trade-offs are why we're providing a look at multiple real-time solutions in this webinar. The degree to which we can guarantee or verify these traits for an operating system varies and again, it's also dependent on the hardware as well as the drivers and application software that run atop the operating system. So by the way, the uh, image on the right here is of a 2D plotter built using our Calibri VF61 module, which leverages the heterogeneous multi-core solution, which we'll be talking about later for achieving the high degree of determinism and precision required for controlling the servos used. So on to the next uh, bullet point. It will also benefit us to utilize a priority-based scheduler, in particular if we assume we're leveraging a multi-threaded OS, which is not perfectly deterministic. And we must ensure high-priority tasks and high-priority interrupt handlers are scheduled ahead of others. Furthermore, the availability of preemption support will improve system response by providing a means for higher-priority tasks to preempt lower-priority tasks, allowing them to access the processor more quickly. And along the same lines, use of priority inheritance in conjunction with preemption helps prevent issues such as priority inversion and deadlock conditions. So I just mentioned priority inheritance. 
as a way of preventing an issue known as priority inversion, this is what priority inversion is. So just to give a quick description here, a low priority task shown at the start of this time plot acquires a lock and then a high priority task wants to preempt that low priority task. It does so, but if it tries to get the same lock, it has to then context switch back to the low priority task such that that task can finish and release the lock before the high priority task can take it. The problem is, is in this case, if a, if a medium priority task preempts now the low priority task, we have an issue known as priority inversion. There's a high priority task waiting, but now the medium priority task has taken the processor. So the way we solve this is through priority inheritance. As soon as that high priority task requires a lock that the lower priority task has, it can raise the priority of the low priority task up to the priority level of the high priority task. That'll prevent the medium priority task from being able to preempt that. So we'll discuss that a little bit later as it applies to real-time Linux. So with those concerns in mind, we created a simple test for evaluating real-time performance across multiple solutions. And this test is essentially a periodic real-time task which toggles a memory map GPIO every 200 microseconds. So you can see that in the bottom right corner here. What we're doing is generating a 400 microsecond or a square wave with a period of 400 microseconds. And we measure that the period every period. So every cycle of this wave, we're measuring the period. It should be 400 microseconds nominally. And what we're actually going to use for this test are measurements of the error, so the jitter the error from 400 microseconds that we see. So this will give us an indication of how deterministic and how reliable the timing is of our real-time solution. In the middle of this test, we're also going to be stressing the processor, the shared buses, and interrupt controller. These are all things that are going to impact the uh, response time of the system. And we want to provide as much stress as possible to ensure that our highest priority tasks are affected as minimally as possible. And so again, we're measuring from, for example, a falling edge to a falling edge to measure the complete period of one cycle. And we're going to make many of these measurements and we're looking at jitter or and the latency that we measure. This test is not meant to provide a complete analysis of the real-time capabilities of the system, but simply to provide some rough insight into the nature of these solutions we perform little to no optimization of the systems for which we test. It's expected that most or all of the test results could be improved through some tuning of the operating systems. The reality is with real time, it doesn't matter how good a scheduler is if there's large bottlenecks somewhere else on the critical path. So this test is not going to be perfect, but I do believe it's effective as an indicator of real time suitability for these different solutions. And for our tests, I'm going to highlight here some of the computing solutions used. The first here on the left, I should also point out these are all NXP based system on chip solutions. So these are all Calibri modules from Tordex utilizing NXP system on chips. On the left side is our Calibri Vibrid modules. These utilize the NXP Vibrid system on chip with a Cortex A5 and of particular note is the VF61 which has an M4 on the same chip as the A5. And this was the first generation from NXP of this heterogeneous multi-core architecture. We don't actually leverage it for the testing performed in the webinar here, but you did see earlier with the 2D plotter, which I pointed out, which uses the Calibri VF61. A later generation of a similar technology is on the Calibri IMX7. This utilizes the NXP i.mx7 system on chip. We have both a solo and a dual core. You'll see here that in addition to the A7s, the Cortex A7s on there, there's also an M4. Again, all in one chip on a shared bus topology. And uh, this is what we'll be using for our tests for um, the heterogeneous multi-core solution. And then finally, on the far right side are the Calibri IMX6 modules utilizing the NXP i.mx6 system on chip. 
We have a Solo and the Dual Light version of the IDA MX6. These are Cortex A9 processors. They also have a GPU. And we also see that they have a 4 gigabyte EMMC, which is quite a bit larger than the NAND flash used on the other modules. And you get an indication of, well, first of all, the, the Calibri IMX6 is used for most of our other tests besides the heterogeneous multi-core test, so for use with Linux and Xenomai. And at the bottom, you'll see the pricing for these modules. It gives you an idea of how these would compete with more traditional real-time solutions, for example, a microcontroller. The price on these, I think, is highly competitive with such solutions, considering that they have a great deal of RAM and flash on board and quite some features in comparison to your typical microcontroller solutions, which are maybe leveraged more heavily in your traditional real-time systems. So we'll kick off our discussion here with the standard Linux kernel. It does make use of a priority-based scheduler, which is good, and it supports preemption. So again, both positive things in terms of determinism and low latency response. Recent kernel support threadable interrupt requests and IRQ priority setting. Again, this is also a positive. In fact, that the IRQs are threadable. It means that they can uh, inherit priority. And of course, with the priority setting, we can give certain interrupt requests higher priority than others. And these are, we also list the standard preemption levels here. So the standard kernel already has multiple preemption levels, which are enabled through the kernel config at compile time. Uh, the first is a uh, um, non preempt or no force preemption um, of the kernel. This is good for batch processing. You're going to get really overall uh, throughput is going to be greatest with this, but it's of very little interest to us. It creates a system which is not very responsive. Uh, voluntary preemption is sort of the default, basically well oriented towards your standard desktop type use case. It's, uh, it has some level of preemption, but it's still not super responsive for many tasks. Um, and then we have preempt, which is a preemptible kernel, also labeled as a low latency desktop. And this is actually quite useful for um, sort of those soft real-time type systems and embedded systems in general. This makes for a more responsive system. Overall throughput is not going to be as high, um, but it does allow for, for better responsiveness making more of the kernel preemptible. And so the test configuration here, um, we tested this configuration on our Calibri IMX6 using the 3.14.52 Linux kernel, using this um, unmodified def config for our Calibri IMX6. And in this case, um, voluntary preemption is enabled. So we ran that test that I described. It's the periodic square wave with a 400 microsecond period. And our histogram here indicates basically at the zero, the center point there, zero would be zero error. So that would be right at 400 microseconds. And then what you're seeing is the distribution of error um, away from zero. And so you can see that the, the number of samples here is in the hundreds of thousands total. And we provide a little um, window here, which is plus or minus 10% of the period. Um, for which 92% of the samples uh, fall within this window. You can see that 2% uh, fall um, on the positive side of that window and worst case being out at uh, 15 milliseconds or so. And then some samples actually show up right at zero. So what you can imagine is we have a 400 microsecond period and this kernel in some cases has latencies that are far beyond the period of our square wave. So what ends up happening, for example, when we have a 15 millisecond wait, um, is that we get multiple GPIO toggles sort of queued up here. And so those are what occur at the, um, all the way at the very left side of the graph here uh, once the processor starts, um, uh, gives back control to our, our real-time task. So let's talk about options for a, a more real-time Linux solution. Um, we have some data now from the standard Linux kernel, which we'll discuss. It's also important to note with the standard Linux kernel, we ran that with the voluntary preemption configuration 
we would have the ability to compile that kernel with the config preempt configuration, which would provide more preemption than this than that default voluntary preempt configuration, which would improve the responsiveness. We didn't test that here, but uh, it's important to know. What we are going to show are some of these other solutions here. The first being a real-time Linux kernel. Uh, so this is an attempt to make the Linux kernel itself more real-time. And we do that by making it more preemptible, basically eliminating all the points in the Linux kernel which disable preemption. And the way we do this is uh, using the popular preempt RT patch set. And then the next solution that we're going to look at is uh, a real-time co-kernel. So this is a kernel um, alongside Linux, which is real-time and provides uh, more responsiveness than the Linux kernel itself. And the solution we'll look at here is Xenobine, which does this. And then finally, the, the other solution we're going to look at is real-time coprocessor. So this is... Um, a second processor, which is basically dedicated for real-time tasks, and it doesn't run Linux itself. Linux will run on, in this case, we'll use the NXPI.MX7, so Linux will be running on a Cortex-A7, and there will be a dedicated M4 running uh, FreeRTOS, so an actual real-time operating system where we can offload those real-time tasks. So it's also important to know here that there are, of course, many other real-time solutions that exist. Um, we're focusing on Linux-based solutions here. Um, there are those which, of course, use other operating systems which are real-time oriented. And um, we're simply not looking at those today, um, partly because of time, but also because we're, we're attempting to focus on, on Linux as being a more approachable operating system. A lot of people have uh, projects or workloads basically already in the Linux space. Uh, so this can be a rather attractive uh, solution. Um, but of course there are other solutions out there. So a look at the real-time Linux kernel using the preempt RT patch set. Um, again, this minimizes the amount of kernel code that is non-preemptible. So uh, non-preemptible parts of the kernel are bad for real-time, uh, at least if those parts of the code are not higher or of highest priority. Um, because we want a high priority task to basically be able to interrupt anything it needs to to make use of the processor. So the way the real-time patch does this, um, actually a lot of what was originally part of this real-time patch has now been up or brought into the mainline kernel. So the mainline kernel has improved quite significantly um, in terms of its real-time capabilities. So I already mentioned that we can uh, configure it for the preempt configuration. Um, and there's other aspects of, of what used to be part of the preempt RT patch, which are now just part of the mainline kernel. So that's a lot of positive movement. We may eventually see all of the capability or all the features of the real-time patch make their way into the mainline kernel. But for now, there's still some things that the preempt RT patch does that is not handled by the mainline kernel. One of the things it does um, is it converts spin locks to sleeping spin locks and it also makes use of RT mutexes. So the, the major positive thing here is that uh, these spin locks, sleeping spin locks and RT mutexes, they do not disable preemption, um, unlike some of their um, the spin locks and such that they replace. Um, so that's a positive thing for increasing preemption. They also, um, and in conjunction with making the interrupt handlers all threadable, this it basically forces threadable interrupt handlers, we enable priority inheritance across all, across all tasks. So uh, again, this resolves the issue of possibly having those um, priority inversion conditions that we discussed earlier. So if you're configuring your kernel with um, the preempt RT patch, you'll see a, a config preempt RT full option, which must be enabled in the kernel config. And you can see some more information about this in the links below. One being the, uh, the real-time Linux project is now uh, an official project under the Linux Foundation, and so there's a link there for that. And then the um, source code for the patch um, is provided there at kernel.org. And so from Toradex, we also have some resources. We provide a kernel recipe. Um, in this case, we're doing our test with the IMX6, uh, and so we provide a real-time kernel recipe on our Git server. It's part of our meta Toradex NXP layer, which is, 
is used with our um, Yocto build system. We use the Yocto project for building our Linux images. So there's a recipe there. It allows, it, it takes care of applying the RT patch and configuring the kernel um, with preempt RT. And then we also have an article on our developer website entitled Real-Time Linux. Um, so there's a link there for that which has more details on this topic. And then finally at the very bottom here you're seeing uh, Code Assist which is a partner of Toradex. Uh, they make software PLCs. They actually leverage uh, preempt RT for the Linux kernel and their solution with our products. So it's a kind of a real world uh, example of, of it in use. So here are some, uh, this is a test called Cyclic Test. It's part of the RT tests um, package, which we actually provide. Um, you can get it with our package manager on our Linux image. Uh, it's also commonly available on other Linux distributions. It's called RT tests and it includes Cyclic Test as one of the um, utilities. And so we ran this test on our Apollo IMX6 with the 3.14.28 kernel, so a little bit older kernel here that these results are from. Um, and we ran it with three different preempt configurations. So preempt voluntary, uh, regular preempt, and then preempt RT full with the uh, preempt RT patch applied. And so the thing you want to take away from this um, is we ran this test for 30 minutes with a thread for each processor core on the uh, CPU and it uses NanoSleep so what it does is it schedules uh, well it has all these threads which go to sleep for some amount of time and then it measures from the time that it should be waking up until the time that the processor actually uh, gives control over at the end of the sleep uh, it measures that latency and so we um, ideally want that latency to be as low as possible because these are given high priority. And, um, and really what we usually look for in this test, it runs for hundreds of thousands or maybe or actually even millions of iterations. And we want to make sure that the maximum latency is not too high. Um, is typically the, the concern for most real-time systems. And so the max is on the far right side of the results here. You can see, um, and again, there's a line for each thread. There are four in each test. Uh, and so that far right side is the maximum latency in uh, microseconds. So you can see with the voluntary uh, preemption configuration, we're getting a really a max of around 23, maybe as much as 23 and a half milliseconds. On the preempt configuration, that comes down to less than a millisecond. So around just under 900 microseconds. And then with the full preempt RT, that brings it down to under 200 microseconds, um, where we see a max of around 187 microseconds. So you see how much um, the impact is of reducing the amount of preemption disablement in the kernel. By making the kernel more preemptible, um, we can bring down system or bring down system response time. This is what our test, that I, the, the periodic square wave test that we perform, looks like on the scope with the preempt RT kernel. So you can see some jitter. That's, um, this is kind of like a histogram type view. Um, so you see that there is quite some visible jitter in the signal. And this is the actual sample histogram. Um, if you recall from our uh, standard Linux sample histogram, we had quite some outliers. And here we really have 99.998% uh, of samples within that plus or minus 10% error window. And uh, absolute worst case error was about 106 microseconds. So substantially better than 15 milliseconds. Um, and so this is already showing quite some improvement. So the next um, solution we're going to talk about is Xenomai. Uh, Xenomai supplements the Linux kernel with uh, a real-time co-kernel core called Cobalt. And it gets actually built into the Linux kernel. And it actually, it basically has another scheduler. And so it actually schedules 
Linux gets scheduled with lower priority than anything on the Cobalt scheduler core. And Zenimai provides a user space, a, a real-time API for Linux user space, uh, which is where you would write your application, making use of this API to um, make use of the Cobalt kernel. There's also a completely native Linux implementation of the real-time framework called Mercury, which Zenimai also provides. Now, this does not make use of a, a co-kernel, and I should also state we didn't test this configuration either. We, we tested the Cobalt co-kernel configuration. But in the case of Mercury, um, you're using purely the Linux kernel, and so uh, it's often used in conjunction with preempt RT in order to actually bring the kernel um, responsiveness down for use with the real-time framework. And um, Tordex doesn't actually provide a uh, readily available Xenomai build for our product. So uh, this one will require a little more effort on, on your part to, to use, but um, we have done some work with it in the past, so uh, we thought it would be interesting to present the results to you. So this is just a, um, this is a diagram of the Xenomai Cobalt configuration. Xenomai supplements Linux with the real-time co-kernel running side by side with it. This small extension named Cobalt is built in the Linux kernel, dealing with all time, criti uh, time critical activities, such as handling interrupts and scheduling real-time threads. The uh, Cobalt core has higher priority over the native kernel activities, and uh, user space applications interface to the core through the Xenomai Cobalt API. So you see that here, the, the application sound in user space interfacing to the core through the uh, Cobalt library. And this is an example, uh, or just showing um, a simplification of our test here on the right side, the, the source code, to, to give you a demonstration of, of the API. So there's some stuff not included in the source here, which would be rather important, but the key here for, for the uh, Xenomai API is you see these RT tasks. We're creating a real-time task called blink task, and then we start that task. And within the, the blink function, we have an RT task, um, uh, a creation of a periodic timer, which is used for the timing of our square uh, square wave. So you can find more information about that at the Zenomai website, zenomai.org. This is just that scope view. We showed you what it looked like with preempt RT Linux. This is how it looks with Zenomai. Uh, quite a bit less jitter. And this is our sample histogram. Here we see actually 100% of samples within that plus or minus 10% error window. Uh, worst case, um, absolute worst case in this case is um, about 17.5 microseconds. So uh, in a rather significant improvement over the preempt RT configuration. And now for the final um, solution that we'll discuss. Um, this is heterogeneous multi-core processing using the NXP IDA MX7 system on chip, which is we provide on our Calibri IMX7 modules. The, um, the IDA MX7, it implements this heterogeneous asymmetric multiprocessing architecture. So it actually has two cores uh, of different architecture. That's the Cortex-A7 and the M4 on the same chip on a shared bus topology. And we actually have the freedom to run separate operating systems on those two cores. So in this case, we make use of Linux on the Cortex-A7 and FreeRTOS on the Cortex-M4. So this is a look at the sort of a high-level look at the architecture. Uh, on the top left, you're seeing the Cortex-A7 cores. On uh, the center top there is the Cortex-M4. You see they're connected to the same bus, um, which is where they share access to the memory, uh, to peripherals. Uh, they also have a messaging and some four units which are used uh, for uh, resource um, control and for messaging each other. Uh, so they can actually communicate each other over um, shared memory. And this is what the software looks like there. Um, again, we're leveraging the Linux kernel on the Cortex-A7 side. We're using Linux uh, 4.1.15. We utilize RPMSG, which is the uh, remote processor messaging system. It's a VirtIO-based TTY driver. That's how we're going to message uh, 
the other core, so from the A7 to the M4. On the M4, we leverage uh, FreeRTOS, the V8.0 kernel. Um, this has support for various build systems, uh, and we provide, um, we utilize OpenAMP, which is the Open Asymmetric Multiprocessing uh, Project, which is open source on GitHub. Um, we use that for the other side of that uh, remote processing messaging framework. So OpenAMP on the FreeRTOS side, which um, connecting with RPMSG on the Linux side. And some of these features currently in the Linux kernel with the 4.1, we have some of our own um, NXP and, and Toradex providing patches on top of the, the mainline kernel to provide this RPMSG support. Um, some of that gets mainlined with starting with the 4.4 kernel. And then we have an article here on the Toradex developer website where you can find out more details about uh, this, all this configuration and uh, also some example source code. This is a view of that, uh, again, the um, oscilloscope view of our square wave test. At this point, um, I'm not sure that you would be able to distinguish any jitter. And here's our sample histogram. It looks very good. Um, worst case um, error that we were able to uh, measure was about half a microsecond. So. Clearly, this is kind of the most ideal solution to have a dedicated coprocessor for use with real-time running a real uh, real-time operating system. And uh, this is an example of this uh, platform in use. We built this uh, robot in conjunction with uh, Ant Micro and the Cube Company, which is how we got the name Talk for our robot. It stands for Toradex Ant Micro and Cube Company. And again, it makes use of the NXPI.MX7 system on chip on our Cortex or on our uh, Calibri IMX7 module. And so I'll show you an example of that in a video. So this is our robot, um, which I hope you're able to see in the video. It's balancing on two wheels. It uses um, again the Calibri IMX7 system on module. Um, it's running the uh, the servo control, a PID control loop, um, it's reading sensors and all of that stuff running on the Cortex M4. And the Cortex A7 has Linux running with the Qt um, UI framework which is powering this application on the display. Um, it also brokers communication out to a, um, uh, a controller so you can actually drive this thing. And what we're showing here is the system booting while the robot is already balancing. So the way that works um, is that basically the M4 is going to come up before the A7 uh, is able to boot Linux. And so when we look at the, the actual boot sequence, the boot ROM initializes the A7 and starts the bootloader on the A7 core. Then within the bootloader, the, uh, the M4 is initialized and the, um, the firmware for the M4 is loaded on the M4 from the A7. Uh, so, so the system is running while the A7 is still in the bootloader and at that point the A7 uh, starts loading the Linux kernel. So this is a good example of this um, architecture in action. And so in conclusion, um, we showed you multiple Linux-based solutions which provide a range of real-time capability, everything from the standard Linux kernel all the way down to a heterogeneous multi-core solution. Um, so uh, really the, the takeaway here is that you have uh, a number of different solutions available with different capabilities. Um, and so you can really kind of choose what is most effective given your system's requirements. Um, and I think it's also important to note that many of these solutions have um, additional optimization potential. We basically took these solutions uh, and tested them as is out of the box, um, and there's almost always certainly some improvements that could be made through optimization and uh, additional configuration. In particular, in the case of the standard Linux kernel, uh, we tested this with only the voluntary preemption configuration but even 
just using the config configure or the uh, preamp configuration in the kernel would likely drastically reduce um, preamp or the uh, latency to some degree. And all these solutions require careful design beyond the OS selection, so I think that's also um, obvious at this point. Um, you really have to take a close look at requirements, analyze the, the choice of hardware, um, be careful with the use of drivers, ensuring that they are indeed um, sort of well oriented for real time use, um, and also careful design of the application to ensure that it's um, making use or, or it, it's written in such a way that it's um, uh, real time capable. So with that said, um, I think we'll go ahead and move into the question and answer period. Um, again, this webinar will be posted um, probably in a, a matter of days from now, uh, um, a recording at toradex.com slash webinars, also on YouTube. And I think we'll also try and make the slides publicly available as well. So you can always reach out to us, um, you know, you can you can ask your questions now in the Q&A. Um, you can also reach out via email. We also have a community website, community.toradex.com, which is also a great place to ask questions. Um, and also check out our developer website, developer.toradex.com. Lots of um, great information there. We also provided a number of links in the webinar. And then finally, also again, Toradex to Toradex.com slash webinars is where you can find um, archives of our past webinars. So there's a lot of other content there as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up the questions here. Well, the first question, will the presentation be available somewhere? The webinar is being recorded, will be provided on YouTube within just a few days. Also on our website at Toradex.com slash webinars. So we archive all our webinars there. You can check out all our old webinars, and this webinar will also show up there. Here's another uh, question. What would impact the error on the preempt RT full system? Is it the complexity of the event, uh, not only toggling into GPIO, or is it the cycle duration longer than 40 micros or 400 microseconds? Not 100% sure I'm following the whole question, but um, in general, there's a lot of things that can affect the error. So certainly when we talk about, you know, toggling GPIO is rather simplistic, but it does kind of rely on a lot of different things. Um, you're actually accessing a bus to access that external GPIO. Certainly with Linux, there's other processes and stuff running there. So there is quite some complexity. And as the complexity of such an event increases, there's much greater possibility for error. So again, this is dependent on the driver. So in this case, the GPIO driver. But if we're using other interfaces for, say, communication or, or whatever the case may be, there's going to be much more possibility for error to accumulate. And I don't think the cycle duration is going to play a big role into that. So again, the the thing is, is that we are using a periodic timer here. Uh, so the duration of the timer is not playing a big role into the amount of error that accumulates. The timer is actually highly precise, but there is more or less the timer deadline occurs. There's some latency by the system to then respond. Uh, that latency, I wouldn't say it's you know fixed or anything, but it's not really too much affected by the actual timer duration. Question about the SDK or API for communication between M4 and A7. So this is where you can check out our developer website, developer.toradex.com. We're using RPMSG on the Linux side of the A7, and FreeRTOS is using the OpenAMP framework. So those are both open source projects. And take a look at, well, basically the short answer is there's an article on our developer website which kind of dives into this topic. So I highly recommend that. There's also a number of examples that, that would help um, kind of understand that and also see the API in action. The next question, do we provide people with test application and 
cookbook on tests we made with Zenomai and Friartas. So yeah, we didn't fully provide all the test source code and everything here, but we could certainly share that information if uh, that's desirable. So I guess what you can do is email me directly, brandon.chibley at toradex.com, and I can make sure we provide sort of that relevant information. There's a request to repeat the explanation of how our robot balances before Linux boots up. So basically we have the two cores on that i.mx7 chip. The A7 and the M4, the A7 is running Linux, and the A7 is actually what comes up first. The boot ROM loads the bootloader on the A7. Early in that boot sequence, after the bootloader is loaded, the M4 is initialized and the firmware is uh, loaded on the M4 for the firmware, which has the FreeRTOS and the PID control application for the balancing. That happens, and then the A7 boots the Linux kernel. So that's why the, the robot is, can very quickly begin balancing, and in the meantime, we then see that uh, Linux is booting on the display. So I hope that uh, answers that question. So somebody was asking how much time is taken for the robot example to go from power on to arriving at the Qt UI application. And this is probably 20 seconds. I mean, we didn't do any boot time optimization at all, primarily because it's kind of cool to show that the, the robot's balancing while Linux is booting. I think we could get boot time down to like five seconds or less. I mean, we have actually fast boot Qt-based Linux demos that boot in for example, 1.2 seconds. So we could certainly get boot time down, but um, again, it's it's probably on the order of 20 seconds because no optimization was performed, and it's kind of just a nice feature of the demo. Again, a question about where to find more information about communication between processors and the heterogeneous platform. So we do have developer.tordex.com is a good place to find that information. There's articles about that. We also have links to those, for example, the OpenAMP project, which is on GitHub, relevant source code for RPMSG and the details of configuring that. Question about what we can expect with QNX. We actually did not test QNX. We are a partner with QNX. The reason we did not is because it's not strictly Linux-based. Um, at least for the purposes of this webinar, focused largely on kind of Linux-oriented solutions. And although QNX is a POSIX OS, uh, it does not make use of a Linux kernel in any way. So, yeah, it was not part of our tests. I couldn't tell you exactly um, how well it compares. It would be an interesting test, I agree. And maybe we can do that sometime in the future. That would be very nice. We do have support for QNX through third parties, namely uh, Triadem is a company that uh, is an official QNX partner and also a partner of Tordex who provides a QNX BSP for our IMX6 based products. So somebody is asking in the case that they want to do something more than just toggling a GPIO but actually say sending data over serial or CAN bus how to ensure that data is sent out periodically to meet some tight timing deadlines, and would Zenomai do the trick? Of course, uh, as with anything with real time, it's probably not a super simple solution or answer here, but it's probably doable with with Zenomai. The key is most likely that there is a compatible driver. So if you need something like a CAN bus driver with that really tight latency utilizing the Zenomai co-kernel, then you probably need to write the CAN bus kernel or driver for the uh, Zenomai co-kernel. It's actually possible that it exists. I don't actually know off the top of my head um, because there are some other IMX6 platforms supporting Zenomai. Let's see, in the case of preempt RT, it's actually probably simpler and that you wouldn't have to necessarily write a special driver for 
uh, a different kernel because there is a driver already. The key is just making sure that the existing driver is optimal enough to meet your timing deadlines. And that I couldn't say with any certainty, but my expectation, though, at least on CAN bus, where latency requirements are very common, it would probably perform relatively well. So somebody asked, what is the best RT Linux solution from my point of view? Yeah, I think that the maybe I should have stated this more strongly in my conclusion. Basically, that there probably isn't one ideal RT Linux solution. It, I mean, you get kind of a range of results, and I think to go to the extreme of uh, having a coprocessor, and in this case, it's not that extreme these days, but in the past, at least, having a whole other processor to meet your real-time requirements is maybe the more extreme solution. But I guess nowadays that's actually a pretty nice solution. We have a module, it's low cost, provides both cores on the same chip. We have the frameworks, which are basically free and open frameworks for uh, communicating between the cores. So I guess that would be a, a pretty easy sell if you need anything close to hard real time. If you're looking more in the kind of that soft real time realm, the, the preempt RT is very easy to uh, utilize. Uh, again, we have the uh, recipes for a real-time Linux kernel, which is uh, available on our Git uh, server, git.toradex.com, and the meta free, let's see, the meta Toradex NXP layer. So again, it's it's quite easy to get going with the preempt RT approach. So that's also not too bad, but again, the performance isn't anywhere near what you can achieve with, say, heterogeneous multicore. Xenomai, it's just going to be more work to bring that up on your own. Unfortunately, at the moment, we're not providing something available out of the box or from our website. Somebody said you took 3.4 kernel as one of the examples for the bare Linux RT support. What about newer versions? Are you aware of? major improvements in the RT support and vanilla kernel. So we actually used, I think, 3.14 for example of the case of uh, the standard Linux test. And yes, there are a lot of stuff that or originated in preempt RT has been mainlined, is now part of the mainline kernel. Not all of it's enabled by default. So that's kind of the major key actually is um, the standard kernel would probably give you reasonably good results. In fact, what you did see in the presentation with the cyclic test slide was when we utilized the config preempt configuration with the standard kernel that we were getting sub millisecond worst case latency, at least with cyclic test kind of and stressing the, uh, the system. So that's quite good and we could probably even do better I mean if uh, more tuning was performed and um, so yeah I think uh, there the kind of the, the stuff that's been done recently with the Linux kernel in terms of real time is, is quite good and so at this point preempt RT is doing not a whole lot anymore but it's still making a significant difference in terms of the actual um, preemption uh, you know, even if, you know, there's still small areas that Linux is basically disabling preemption in, those can have kind of a large impact still on the response time, worst case response time, I should say. Average response time is basically the same between these two systems, but it's that worst case that we really want to put a, try and put a bound on the worst case uh, latency. So somebody was asking which Toradex board they should start with. They want to make a RTOS for sensors and make UIs uh, using Qt. Well, the Calibri IMX7 would be a great example here. You could actually run free RTOS on the M4, Linux on the A7, just like we did with the robot. Qt runs there. The only limitation is that uh, there is no GPU on the IMX7, so 
with Qt, you would run that basically without hardware accelerated graphics. But you can see in the case of the robot that um, you know you can still have a pretty good looking UI. And Qt also has a 2D renderer, which is available with their commercial products. It works very well on the Amix 7 uh, without a GPU. What do I recommend for low latency real-time audio? So actually, the Linux kernel with like config preempt is pretty well kind of suited for this. Preempt RT would also work if you needed to go even better. I don't think you would need to go to anything more extreme than that. Those are, in fact, uh, config preempt, I think, is uh, very commonly used in kind of the audio realm for achieving that uh, low latency real-time audio. And does Toradex offer any A53 64-bit ARM-based products? The answer currently is no. However, we expect that uh, down the line there's going to be some stuff, quite likely from NXP, so I can't say anything officially, but yeah, that's, that's likely to come. Are there any Tordex products on the A-Core side that can run a full Linux desktop and a browser capable of supporting YouTube video streaming? The answer is yes. Many of our products could do this. Let's see. I mean, basically our standard Linux evaluation image that we provide has the lightweight desktop environment, has a browser, and so the only key is with YouTube videos or any videos really streaming, is having support in the browser for the um, hardware decoding codecs. Uh, IoT related solutions available? Well, I mean, all of our products can be used in sort of an IoT use case or application space. We're not currently providing a module that has Wi Fi on board the module itself. That's also something that is uh, possibly coming down the line, but all of our products are capable of interfacing with Wi-Fi devices, for example, on a carrier board. Um, so all our computer modules require some kind of carrier board to be used in conjunction with. And on a carrier board is a perfect place to put, say, a Wi-Fi module that interfaces, for example, over SDIO, or in some the case of our Apollos modules, they could be a PC, mini PCI Express module, or even a USB. Wi-Fi device. So, yeah, they're, I'd say they're well suited for the IoT space. Okay, so I think that's it for questions. I want to thank everybody for coming. You can check out this webinar uh, recording at a later date at toradex.com slash webinars. And, um, and uh, keep an eye out for uh, future webinars from Toradex. Have a great day.